everyone. Uh, it's such a delight to, uh, to have all of you. Uh, my name is Vish Vishwanath. I am uh, a professor of health communications and behavioral sciences at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Dana Barber Cancer Institute. More critical, I think, I'm the faculty director for the Harvard Chan's India Research Center. This program is being uh, uh, co-hosted along with us by our colleagues at, from HPS. Uh, Anjali Raina is here. Uh, so it's such a delight. I know she has been, uh, thank you for joining us, Anjali. I have been flying all night. You know, so uh, they have been extraordinarily helpful in organizing this. Usually, you know, I do this before I start the program. I want to thank my team, because at the end, we forget, you know, uh, <laughs> the tremendous hard work uh, our team has been uh, you know, putting in uh, to, to this effort. Uh, Dr. Neha Gulati, Kushpa Agarwal, Dr. Khan should be somewhere here, and the rest of the team uh, managing it. Uh, this is our first event, hybrid event. Uh, we, uh, you know, post-COVID, we have always done webinars for the last uh, two and a half years we have done more than 16 or 17 webinars with uh, some 25,000 people showing up uh, but this is our first event so we'll see we'll, there may be some glitches here and there but I'm just so happy we are doing it tonight you know uh, and we have two very distinguished panelists joining us uh, so the uh, what I want to, you know, do the 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 reason I think um, uh, the rationale behind this program uh, is to focus on two types of risky behavior. Uh, one is tobacco use, other is uh, alcohol use. Um, both of which uh, I actually give a lot of credit to Dr. Gotheridge, uh, who has been pushing me to organize a program around this topic for a while. Um, of course, we have tobacco, we have been doing this naturally. We have done many programs, but not enough on alcohol. Um, and, and, and so as we thought about it, uh, we felt, you know, here are two significant contributors to public health issues. Of course, we treat uh, tobacco use and the diseases associated with tobacco use are caused by tobacco use and alcohol as individual level problems. Uh, but actually, these are two big public health problems, uh, which uh, which cause a variety of uh, both personal as well as collective ills, um, uh, contributing to uh, you know, really uh, significant uh, both public health problems as well as social problems. Uh, so we thought we will use that filter today. Uh, using, uh, you know, uh, talking about these twin problems uh, from both a, a public health perspective, a policy perspective, and of course a, a medical perspective and an epidemiological perspective. You know. So we have a very uh, distinguished group of panelists. I'm so grateful uh, that uh, they, are, uh, they have agreed to join us uh, on the screen. Uh, you will see uh, Dr. Pratima Murthy, uh, who is the uh, director of NIMHANS. A lot of you, all of you know what NIMHANS is. You know, she's also a professor of psychiatry, and in addition to her administrative hat, she's a world-renowned researcher with more than 250 <laughs> publications uh, uh, focusing around issues of addiction. Uh, if I read her entire uh, uh, achievements here, we yeah. will be spending the next hour because she has been so uh, highly recognized for her uh, 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 research work and administrative work and leadership in this area, especially around the substance abuse issues. So, Dr. Murthy, thank you for joining us. We are delighted to have you here. Thank you uh, very much. Nice to be here. Uh, and then on the screen also we have a very close friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Zeming Schwan. Dr. Schwan is uh, an epidemiologist, is actually a social epidemiologist by training. He has done a lot of interesting work in a variety of areas. He is a world-renowned methodologist and measurement expert, uh, but he's very unique because he also can talk about theory and, and problems, social problems. Uh, we, I personally rely on him on methodological me measurement issues, uh, and he has been doing work um, 
on uh, alcohol, epidemiology around alcohol, alcohol use, uh, and tobacco use, both in the United States as well as India. Zimin, correct me if I am wrong, you know, so, uh, and it's very early in the morning for him, 8 o'clock in the morning, you know, so thank you, Zimin, for joining us, uh, 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 a great colleague of us. Uh, and then, uh, with me here uh, in the room, uh, to my extreme left, nothing to do with ideology, right? You know, so, <laughs> to my extreme left uh, is uh, Mr. Kartike Dhanji, uh, a very senior IAS officer uh, who is playing multiple roles, uh, as you all seem to do. Uh, he's, a, he's the excise commissioner cum uh, IG, uh, Inspector General Registration Officer on Special Duty, uh, for the Bihar Institute of Public Administration and Rural Development. Uh, I have come to know him over the last few months uh, working on some training and capacity building programs in Bihar, or as it is called, Bihar, right? Yes. And we had a number of interesting conversations around Bihar is uh, one of the few states in the country with uh, an explicit uh, policy of prohibition of alcohol. And I was totally fascinated by it, because I was influenced by our American experience going all the way back uh, to the 1930s. Uh, but as I began uh, our conversations and my several meetings with him, uh, I learned from him and subsequently read about uh, the tremendous role played by women uh, in Bihar. Um, you know, I, I, I've been reading uh, early American history um, uh, recently, and, and the temperance movement actually in the U.S. was started by women in the 19th century. So, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great, uh, there is a great story in Bihar here, and uh, uh, he was graceful enough to come all the way from Patna to come and join us um, and, and share some thoughts with us. And, and, and finally, uh, Dr. Rati Gadrej, a good friend, uh, uh, she's an advisor to us at the Harvard Chan India Research Center, but that's not the reason she is here. She is actually a practicing physician, a, a graduate of the uh, University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, um, the, you know, she has a great deal of experience around not only clinical experience but public health leadership experience, uh, advising a number of public health institutes, including ours. Uh, so she is one of those unique people who can straddle what's happening in the US with what's happening in India. Uh, and then I also uh, rely on uh, Dr. Godrej on what's happening with the companies and corporate world and their uh, health policies. Um, so thank you, uh, Dr. Godrej, for joining us. So what we thought we will do, it's going to be a very informal conversation. Uh, I will. Uh, uh, I will, what I will do is, I will uh, uh, just introduce a topic, take a couple of minutes, then I will ask each uh, panelist to open, make some opening remarks for a couple of minutes, uh, and then I will follow up with questions. Uh, and, and I will open it up for the audience here in the room, as well as on the Zoom. That rhymes very well, in the room, on the Zoom, uh, uh, pretty soon. So you know, I was uh, thinking about it as, as I was putting together uh, this talk, uh, and I was preparing for Bihar. You know, I, we were going through the data, and and uh, the Bihar data are very interesting, which is not too different from from other places when it comes to alcohol. And I'm sure um, uh, Dr. Murthy and uh, Dr. Shwan and others can correct me, or, or uh, you know, if I'm wrong. But when it comes to Bihar, we were looking at some data. Uh, about 15% of the men, actually, uh, more than women, uh, use alcohol, very, or abuse alcohol. But two things stood out for me when I was looking at it. One was the consumption was very high in rural areas. Uh, that, that stood out. It's men and it's rural areas. But uh, out of personal interest, I was looking at the data on domestic violence or as we in the US call, you know, in, in, intimate uh, partner violence, ITV. And it looks like the data is so clear. You know, 23% of the women have faced some kind of domestic violence or ITV uh, if the husband doesn't drink. 
one in four. I mean, that is one in four. That is, that is not yeah. good news in many ways. But if they do drink or if they don't drink? If they don't drink, if they don't drink. But if they drink, if the husband gets drunk often, it's 70%. Mm. Right? Now, but one can always quibble with the data, how they are collected, what the data are, but the trajectory and the trends are very clear, right? Uh, any, anybody, and, and, and we uh, in public health argue that intimate partner violence and domestic violence is a public health problem. It's not an individual problem. It's a public health problem. And so these data, and, and of course it is, these are, um, same thing with tobacco, as many of you know, um, uh, tobacco, India has 12% of world's tobacco users, um, and tobacco leads to more than uh, a million people dying every year. Every year. Uh, and and it, it's a much more widely known story than alcohol. Situation, I mean, I think there have been some fascinating observations in different parts of the country. One is, of course, during lockdown. We know that, for example, the admissions uh, related to alcohol, why it made, uh, the accidents related to alcohol came down. We've actually published a paper to that effect. But the serious problems associated with alcohol continue to present in our emergency. But post-COVID, I mean, post-lockdown, there was a surge in the use of alcohol and the presence of alcohol-related problems. So, I mean, you see that uh, the environment also plays an important role. Uh, again, loneliness, stress, grief are all associated with the use of substances. So I think when you look at the use of substances, one must move away from a very simplistic, you know, here and now, to looking at upstream events that might lead to the use of substances in a population. And our, perhaps one of the biggest upstream events has been normalizing the use of substances in our communities. So I think from prohibition to normalization, there's an entire range of the way substances are used in our community. And uh, the other thing is, of course, a stigma associated with seeking help. I think although we have normalized it on the one hand, there is still a lot of hesitation for people to report alcohol-related problems. And therefore, sometimes there is a long latency of 10 to 15 years before the person has their first alcohol-related problem and then actually lands up to the treatment services. And in the treatment services, particularly women, there is an even greater delay. I mean, all of us have heard of telescoping as a phenomenon in women. They might start later, but they develop problems very quickly. And sadly enough, women don't come till their roles are completely impaired or they develop neuropsychiatric symptoms like, for example, seizures or you know, alcohol-related psychosis. So again, there's a huge gender-related variation. There are cultural variations. Stigma plays an important part in treatment safety. So all of this needs to be considered when we look at this very complex issue of substance use. Don't you wish? Thank you, Dr. Moti. I think uh, you raised a number of issues, which I uh, I wrote down some notes here, and which I want to come back to, particularly around normalization. Um, uh, my own field actually focuses a lot of attention on normalization and other communications and advertising, uh, but also on substance abuse issues. But I want to come back to that a little later. Uh, and you are right. You know, I have a, a datum here which says. In 2012, which was the last data that were available in our case, 33.1% of all the road traffic accidents were attributable to drunk driving. You know? So it, it is a major issue, uh, indeed. Uh, but uh, so we have been talking about um, um, alcohol, uh, most of the men consuming alcohol, though I'm glad Dr. Murthy pointed out that it is also increasing in women. Uh, and I, I think the data have to catch up uh, with, the, with the reality here. Uh, but, but the problem is not confined to men, even though they are the people who are drinking mostly, right? And as we discussed, it's, it's, it's women who are affected by it. It is a household that is affected by it. So I, I want to get to this uh, issue of policy, overall approach. So Mr. Tanji, tell us, uh, from 2016, I think roughly, right? Yes. 
Bihar has imposed uh, prohibition as a policy. Yes. What is the rationale behind it? Why did you do that? And and, and what is your experience in, in doing it? Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you. And uh, in Constitution of India, there is Article 47. Louder, please. Right. In, Can you speak louder? In, in Constitution of India, Article 47 provides that states shall endeavor to prohibit intoxicating drinks and drugs and such substances. That is the basis, you can say, guiding principle. And it is a guiding principle for the entire country. In 2015, however, it became a political issue. There was last scale women's uh, movement against alcohol through all shops and all. So it was promised during the polls that if the government comes back, so it will be implemented in a phased manner. First, the IMF, uh, the country liberal bank, then the IMF. It was planned accordingly as uh, it was planned in history in several other states. So the law was formulated, the rules were framed, the machinery was oriented. Earlier, their orientation was to sell the liquor. Now their orientation was completely different, to stop the liquor. So from the 1st April 2016, it was decided that we are going to ban the country liquor. In the next four days, there were large scale uh, law and order issue in front of the IMFL selling shops. So women stage protest that you have to stop this also. So from 5th April, just after four days of implementing first phase of prohibition, from 5th April 2016, total prohibition was imposed in Bihar. Now the rules were framed, law was enacted. There was uh, unanimity in the legislature uh, for passing such law across all party uh, politics. And then uh, the um, police agency and excise agency, these are the two main agencies which are there to enforce. Now, when we see, when we discuss about prohibition, there are two aspects. First, enforcement, and the second, benefits. Okay, uh, you forwarded me several questions. Now, all these questions can be categorized into these two things. That enforcement, how the government uh, enacted measurements, how it uh, developed idea and all, for implementation, and second, what benefits we have uh, accrued. I have a detailed presentation uh, in course, I can present that also. The enforcement, as far as enforcement is concerned, the government is wholeheartedly uh, implementing. In the last six years, there have been around four lakh cases of prohibition violation, and there have been around more than uh, around five lakh arrests uh, for violation of prohibition. Uh, the, there have been many convictions. The law is very strict, so the convictions, uh, uh, the convicted uh, criminals get uh, uh, punishment from five years to life imprisonment in jail. And then uh, there are several issues. Now we come to the, if we come to the benefits that you know we are discussing, like the women's empowerment, the lower class uh, income uh, improvement health improvements, morbidity improvements, and then the hospital health expenses, educational expenses, the expenses after uh, good I mean, services or food, nutritious food, and then we have this uh, uh, women's doing more economic activity because there is no fear of drunken people after uh, sun, uh, sunset. So women are able to move around freely even during night, they are able to sell any, they are able to operate any shop even during the night time. Their ability to travel evening during evening hours or during late night improved. Zero drunken driving deaths or accidents. Rather, I will say that from 2016 onwards, there is not a single drunken driving accident in Bihar. And because of that, the people are traveling more because they know that the traveling is safe. It is safer than what was earlier. So there are many such benefits. Women's participation in decision making improved a lot. The status of women improved. The perception of, the, there was a question that how people perceive this act, this policy. We conducted recently one uh, survey, socioeconomic impact of uh, prohibition. Uh, 
80% uh, of the people supported that this policy is good for our society and it is required, very much required. And the rest of the people, they either agreed or they wanted some changes in the policy. So there is a huge chunk of population which supports this policy in, and, and they support, and media is also very positive. They, they also highlight success stories. And there have been many, many success stories as far as we have, we government has provided alternative livelihood programs also for the for the communities that were doing this country made liquor, distilling at uh, you know at home since centuries. That that was a practice, but now they are shifting to some other activities. It is very difficult in a given a cultural setting. It is very difficult, but they are trying to switch over to other activities. There are many challenges also, like cross border, you know, smuggling the connivance of staff, behavioral issue. People don't treat it as a crime to drink liquor. Okay, so it is, there are a lot of such challenges also which we are trying to uh, improve. And uh, overall, if I say again, the, the conclusion of that study, there is, I got one, you know, recently I got one uh, paper also published by one of the students of Harvard University. I don't know from where uh, he or she got the details, but he has also written about this uh, Bihar Prohibition Act. And uh, it is mentioned that the prohibition has been able to bring down, cutting down the expenditure on alcohol side, which has increased the expenditure on good uh, investment side. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Yeah. So. Um, but I want to come back uh, to you a uh, little later on, on the challenges and things like that. Because uh, we looked at the data, we were presenting some of those data uh, with, with the trainees. Uh, the good news story doesn't come out as much as the headlines I was showing you, uh, which always supports the bad news, right? the failure, quote unquote failure, rather than the success stories we are talking about. Uh, so we should come back and talk about it because it, it's related to this notion of normalization and acceptance. What is what is being perceived by people, even though there's a large public support? Uh, as um, but uh, as we talk about this, there's one uh, aspect that we haven't talked about it yet, Dr. Gautreich. Right? So uh, you know, and, and uh, Dr. Murthy was alluding to this earlier. What happens in a clinical encounter? Why is it that we are not able to um, talk about it openly? Right? We see this. I mean, in the U.S., as you know, um, it's a part of the EMR, right? You know, the physicians look at tobacco use and alcohol use and other things, even domestic violence is the suspect. You know, they are reporting. But so, given your experience in both places, why is it that we don't do this at this? clinical encounter given your experience. Right. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here with such a wonderful panel. Thank you. Um, I think there are many challenges. First of all, uh, physicians and healthcare providers are usually uh, don't have the time to go into very detailed history, mm -hmm. which I think is extremely important. Um, I think we also tend to think that um, we know what is right and we feel that the patient should listen to us and we have now found that you need to really understand the motivation of the patient to why they're smoking and why they're not. I think that um, we are very judgmental and usually thinking that why are they not stopping? They've got cigarettes with you know, faces of tumors on top of it. Why would anyone be still smoking? But obviously they are, and obviously people know the ill effects, so there's a great deal that we need to learn from the patients about why they are smoking, and then try and address those particular issues. Um, and I think that we think of addiction, but actually the spectrum, as Dr. Murthy said, is very wide. You know, when it comes to alcohol, there is alcohol use, which we know even sometimes small alcohol levels can have some deleterious health effects. Then there's alcohol usage, which is excessive. Then there's abuse. And then there's addiction. And I think a physician or a healthcare provider needs to see that entire spectrum. Because we usually have a little box that says alcohol, yes or no, if so, how many drinks per week? And that's sort of the end of the story very often. 
but really that's not making the difference. So we do need to do a very proper history, and of course, as most of you who've worked in tobacco control know, that means asking those five A's where we ask them in detail, you know, why do you smoke? When did you start? Have you tried to quit? When do you have the hardest time, you know, stopping? So I think that detailed evaluation is just not happening in most settings. Maybe because physicians are pressed for time, maybe because there's not compensation or reimbursement for the time that's being used for that. Possibly the patient is also a little reticent about admitting some of these issues. So that's, that's one of the key factors, but definitely we need to ask. Definitely we need to advise them that there are ways to quit and uh, that same thing for alcohol, we need to tell them that there are ways now uh, for them to stop and uh, pharmacological, non-pharmacological behavior, um, individual counseling, um, variety of ways now that we can try and help people reach their goals. And then of course we need to um, evaluate and follow up with them. We can't just let that message go, which is what happens until your next visit. We need to follow up with them and find out, did this message make a difference? Have you been able to cut back? Instead of drinking every day, are you at least drinking now less? And come back in two weeks and let's see where we are with your tobacco intake or your alcohol intake. And that's not just a tick box, yes or no. I think it takes a tremendous amount of time and rapport building and a good relationship with that patient to be able to actually make a difference. And we were always taught, and I think they're still taught in medical school, that smoking and stopping, that is probably the one health behavior you can do that's actually going to change the quality and the longevity of your life. So we need to really go, I think, deep into the issues of who is smoking, why are they smoking, and what we can do to try and get them to stop. And when it comes to alcohol, you know, alcohol use, moderate, severe, it's not always addiction where people cannot stop when they want to or drink more than they can. So there's that whole evaluation called the cage evaluation, some of you must know, where you're checking and seeing, you know, do you feel you need to cut down? You know, are you annoyed when people say you're drinking too much? You know, and are you bugged by that when your college friends tell you you're drinking too much? You know, are you feeling guilty? And you sometimes need a drink early in the day just to get you through. So those are very important questions. There's a whole scale, and very few physicians and practitioners use this. So where are we going to see that the outcomes are going to change unless we really change the way we approach patients who have um, you know, any sort of substance use, whether it's tobacco or alcohol? So I feel this is extremely important. And um, I think we need to really be in partnership with the patient. We need to work with them. We need to collaborate with them. And every step, even if it's one attempt and they don't succeed, it's a step closer towards them finally reaching you know, a positive outcome. So we need to celebrate that. We need to work with them. And now in this age of technology, we can send messages. We can call them. We can just see that we are moving a little forward in, in the uh, goal that we want, which is for stopping tobacco and certainly stopping alcohol or certainly decreasing it by a significant amount. Because the less drinks you have, the more less dependent you are on them on a daily basis, the less likely you're going to have other issues like relationship issues, injuries, accidents, um, a variety of different health issues as well. So I think physicians, healthcare providers, counselors really need to go much, much deeper if we're going to see things improve. Great, thank you. So I, I want to um, take a systems perspective mm -hmm. uh, from what you are saying, uh, and then so that we can go from a clinical healthcare system to more a policy system approach. So, uh, so Dr. Murthy, what what is it we are not so let me let me just first start by saying in the U.S. Um, there is a system in place. There is some kind of a training that is provided to the healthcare providers to recognize these things, which Dr. Godrej was talking about, right? You know, so uh, and then there are ready referral services, and uh, so we have been in to to at least to an extent we have been able to do that with tobacco, in, even in India. 
But alcohol, we haven't done that. I, at least that's, that's my, maybe I'm ignorant. Uh, but what is it that's, that's preventing us from taking that kind of a systems approach within the healthcare system? Um, um, as you said, it's a whole spectrum. It's tobacco, it's comorbidities, it's, uh, it's mental health, it, you know. Uh, all these things sometimes play a role. Can you, can you tell us a little, talk, to, talk us through, given, given the role of the institute? Yeah, so I mean, I think the International Labor Organization puts it very, very nicely. When you look at a population, it's like a standing pyramid, at least in India. A large part of the population is still a non-drinking population. And then you have, as you grow up the pyramid, you have some people who are using alcohol in a harmful or hazardous manner. And then at the tip of the pyramid, you have people who are using it in a dependent manner. And then, but when you look at the interventions, it's an inverted pyramid. You're spending a large number of your resources for tertiary care of patients who have severe alcohol dependence, who are likely to be recidivist in treatment, which means it's a chronic relaxing condition, and if you don't follow them up, they don't do very well. And you're ignoring the people who are moving up this pyramid. So I think that's very, very important to make sure that people know the risks of substance use, whether it's tobacco, whether it's alcohol, whether, whether it's any other drug use, right in the beginning, and are able to monitor. Dr. Godridge mentioned CAGE, there is the audit, there is the assist, and these are good ways of trying to get people to understand if they have harmful ways of using substances. So a lot of, I mean, workplaces have some, some of them have initiated this kind of screening and trying to help people. But as Vish said, I think it hasn't really expanded to routine care. Let me start off with tobacco use. Uh, in, uh, tobacco use, perhaps in the early 2000s, we started this concept of tobacco cessation clinics, where you know people were actually referred to, and they, you know, they were evaluated and they were helped to reduce their tobacco, mainly through behavioral means. Uh, it also means that physicians are themselves not trained enough, not comfortable enough to actually services. So what we find even to this very day is that while physicians might ask about tobacco use or alcohol use, it, apart from advice to stop, they don't provide the support that is necessary to stop. So that becomes very important. Uh, the only positive changes that, I, I, that are occurring about from the tobacco cessation clinics is now we have something called the National Tobacco Control Program, which tries to empower, at least at the district level, for people to run the you know, district tobacco control, uh, tobacco cessation cells. We also have something called the tobacco quick line, which is run out of four centers in the country. We have something called end cessation, you know, where you can actually give a missed call to a number and you can actually get advice as to how to stop. Now let me tell you, each of these facilities, you know, addresses or you know, serves more of several lakhs of people. However, given a population of 1.3 billion and growing, none of these facilities are enough. So I think we really need to look at solo healthcare providers, people in primary healthcare, people who, you know, who are other healthcare providers apart from doctors, also to especially nurses, for example, to engage in you know, tobacco cessation. When you look at alcohol, again, there is, I think there is still a moral issue around alcohol, then looking at alcohol as a public health problem. You know, we talked about needing to screen people for alcohol use. I think that's critical and we've been insisting for a very long time that the use of alcohol, past use, current use, linking the alcohol to the current problem must become a part of every healthcare provider initiative. You need to, you need to record this. You also need to perhaps personalize the individual's drinking and the health risks that they are presenting with. And that is a very useful way of motivating people to consider their substance use behavior. I mean, I just, this morning I was in the outpatients, I had this 30-year-old uh, man, uh, and uh, he had 
you know, he was, uh, he dropped out of engineering. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he didn't have much success in his academic career. So he started working in his father's provision store. And because he had a lot of time on his hands and, you know, ready money on his hands, and he was lending money to other friends to support their drinking habit, he himself got into the drinking habit. At one time, he was uh, smoking about three to four packets of cigarettes in a day. The moment his engagement was announced, he was able to quit tobacco entirely on his own without any kind of external help, which is very really unusual. I mean, one of those things. But then his alcohol problem started growing. And then when you looked at his alcohol problem, it was primarily because of the stress of, you know, of some interpersonal strain, marital discord, you know, pulled between his family of origin and his, you know, his, his wife. So these were the stresses that were maintaining the drinking. And then he only came into treatment when he started having hallucinations. So there was this entire period, possibly of about 10 or 12 years, where there were lots of problems beginning to happen. His patterns of alcohol consumption were changing. And unfortunately, you know, he didn't seek help then. But the important thing is that this is typically the kind of person who comes to us when problems have begun in terms of, as I mentioned, you know, psychiatric problems, they're not able to speak, they had serious problems at work and so on. So the, what I wanted to emphasize is that there is a gradual shift in looking only at tertiary, you know, severe alcohol dependence, looking at people who have minor forms of dependence, and I think we need to do much more of that. In healthcare, we need to personalize risks to people, to try and tell them the advantages, Dr. Godrej referred to the advantages of, I first asked them what are the advantages of drinking? Because if they, they, there were no perceived advantages, they wouldn't be drinking. So clearly alcohol does something for them. And the way to motivate clients is really to get them to see both the few advantages, but the growing list of disadvantages from using alcohol. And then you explore what are the barriers to be able to change their behaviors. And then you try and help them to overcome these barriers. And then of course, you know, there is both you know, treatment of withdrawal symptoms, which is very important and that very often when they're withdrawn, that's the reason they go back to drinking. So if you support them during their withdrawal with both medication as well as counseling, you teach them alternate lifestyle behaviors, you help them to handle their craving, but most importantly, you follow them up. Because as I mentioned, it is chronic and adapting. So one of the changes that we've made in our institution and have tremendous success with is actually having follow-up counselors. Earlier, we realized that a lot of patients dropped out of treatment. And when the follow-up counselors called them, the patients were very ashamed to come back because they thought the you know, going back to alcohol was a failure on their part. The health providers had put in so much effort and they hadn't been able to live up to the expectations. But what our uh, follow-up counselors do is educate them and tell them, look, relapse is inevitable. You can actually try and identify the signs for relapse. But if even if you should relapse or relapse, don't worry, come back quickly. And in that way, we've actually improved our follow-up rates by you know, from 5 to 10% at the end of one year to almost 60 to 70%. So I think the way you engage people with substance use problems, the, the treating them with respect, separating the individual from the disorder, working in a therapeutic alliance with the individual, all these make a huge amount of change from brief interventions to more you know, intensive interventions. Again, as the problem is on a spectrum, so are the interventions. And I think it's important that we develop systemically a whole range of interventions to help people, you know, to uh, to give up, to deal with their alcohol rate problems. Finally, I just also mentioned that there are studies which are now looking at community-based interventions. Yes. You know, that people don't have to travel long distances, right. but it's available in their communities. Right. So, before, uh, thank you. That that was a uh, uh, you raised again a number of issues. Uh, before I jump to Dr. Zeming, maybe Dr. Gadri, you want to look yes, at this. That was such a wonderful way of seeing all the interventions we can do at various stages of the spectrum. But I think we need to also take these programs outside of the medical setting and uh, going to colleges and schools and areas where alcohol is just the norm now. 
In fact, you have to apologize if you take someone out and it's a dry day, you have to apologize profusely that they don't have access, you know? So it's very strange because college students, uh, work culture is all about consumption of alcohol. And um, I think one of the things that I was really impressed with when my son went to the US was that his college had uh, a club where people could just go out and have fun without alcohol, you know, it was at Stanford, it's called the Cardinal Club, and it was just to have fun but no alcohol. And there were lots of students who wanted to go because their only option to do something like that, wherever else they were socializing, there was tons of alcohol and they've chosen not to drink. So you need to make it acceptable for them to also choose not to have alcohol. And you also need to have the work culture have many other incentives and ways of socializing than just holding you know, happy hours and uh, open bars and weddings where everyone is just looking forward to the bar opening. Because this is, I think, where we take it into the community. And we're gonna make a much bigger impact if we take it out of the medical setting or the healthcare setting and take it right directly to the people. Well said. So, um, in fact, I was thinking about it, right? So, th there's one part which is a pathology Right, it's addiction, it's individual level problem, uh, intensive counseling, treatment, walking them through holding their hand, right? But there are, and then there are systems level, policy level kind of uh, enablers of this, right? Uh, uh, marketing, the, the normalization has come up a couple of times, uh, both Dr. Murthy used the term, uh, Dr. Zimming used that. Uh, so, uh, and that is the, uh, on the other end, which is, uh, that requires a more of policy perspective, right? It's not the uh, individual uh, treatment counseling perspective, but somehow the policy has to be played a significant role. Uh, for example, in tobacco, I, I can speak about tobacco very comfortably, right? Now we have the framework convention in tobacco control, which is the first global public health treaty, you know, addressing tobacco very explicitly. Uh, a number of uh, you have worked here with in, in this area. But we don't seem to have that uh, kind of thing uh, for alcohol. So Zimming, Dr. Zimming, can, what can we learn from, you know, uh, from marketing? Uh, we have this experience with tobacco. Uh, you have been working in India as well as in the U.S. Uh, what can we, is, what is portable? What is not? Uh, and then I thought I'd come back to Mr. Danji on, on the policy side. You know, so. Thank you. I really learn a great deal now from you know the community efforts in the medical settings in India. I think this really highlights this uh, sort of like the high risk approach that is common focusing on those who experience problems. But given it's a social stigma, there are a lot of people who are not seeking help, and how we can address them? Well, typically, we rely on you know the sort of like the prevention paradox. You know, one of the major contribution from the late Joe Gross prevention paradox, where we can see, you know, the majority of the cases, you know, looking at for example, are actually attributable to people who normally represent low or no risk of alcohol consumption. But, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they have some drinks at night, they feel they can drive, but then they contribute most of the cases. Right, so it's it really, you know, by looking at this population distribution of risk attributable to alcohol, it's really important to combine methods of the high risk approach, you know, in medical setting, in college setting, um, with population level levels, like, you know, uh, reducing alcohol availability, taxation, and then restrictions of alcohol uh, marketing and advertising. These are the three, um, what WHO would say, the best buy policies. They have very strong evidence base. Um, they are shown to be quite effective in reducing alcohol affordability, availability, and obviously the influence from, from the alcohol industry in attracting, you know, probably one of the most, or some of the most vulnerable populations particularly youth population and, and female populations where we have seen, you know, a reducing gap of gender difference in consumptions. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really learned a great deal from, you know, some of the challenges in, in India, 
uh, addressing the high risk approach, but at the same time, I think it's really important to advocate this population level um, level policies. Uh, one of the fascinating um, um, aspects of alcohol regulation between U.S. and India is that, you know, despite there is just a handful of federal policies or national policies, uh, for example, you know, the legal drinking age is federally implemented, but most of the policies um, that regulate alcohol consumption, sales, and drinking and driving, for example, they are regulated at the state level. In the U.S., you know, all 51 states have their own alcohol policies, and it could vary substantially. And uh, we've done a study to characterize, you know, uh, a basket of 29 alcohol policies that have implemented, been implemented at the state level. And what we found is, you know, states that have stronger or more stringent alcohol control policies, they are associated with um, lower excessive consumption, lower level of alcohol-related problems in terms of drinking and driving, youth consumption, alcohol-related violence, uh, or even chronic uh, outcomes such as liver cirrhosis rates uh, at both population level and, and also at individual level. So we found some really compelling evidence about alcohol control. And in, in, in India, um, we are really glad to know Bihar had, had changed their two prohibition. But there, I, 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 my, I have um, dappled on uh, understanding the landscape of uh, alcohol control in India, which is also uh, fascinating that you know, many of the control policies are being implemented at the province or the union territories. So there is a great heterogeneity of these kind of, sort of contextual differences. And they matter, right? You know, think about, you know, we're putting a lot of resources to help those high-risk drinkers, those who drink excessively, uh, go through medical treatments of pharmacological approach. But when we let them go back to the community where they will be exposed to the drinking context, you know, the consumption, the, the liquor stores around the corner, the stress that they need to deal with every day, it's not surprising to us, right? They will relapse. <coughs> they, they will go back to their drinking patterns very soon. So I think it's extremely challenging, but critically important to change the social context for them by advocating meaningful and effective policy. Um, and, and you know, the evidence in, in India is not very thick in terms of you know, what policies are effective and uh, how can we use the, the, the you know, between province heterogeneity to explain the difference in uh, alcohol consumption at population <coughs> level and also at individual level. So I am eager to learn more um, uh, as we have this you know, conversation. Wonderful. Uh, I mean, that was very explicitly <coughs> answered. I think that, that was very helpful. You are raising a number of policy issues. So, so Dr. Muthi, do you want to address the specific issue before I go to Mr. Dhanji on this? You are, you are on mute. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to a couple of issues that you raised. And one is that the age of drinking itself is variable across different states. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is that, uh, I mean, in fact, uh, uh, the number of liquor wins uh, we have some restrict legal restrictions in terms of liquor vents, but uh, the you know the number of vents is is so and it's it's made so attractive. I mean, for example, if you go to a state like Punjab, you know you'll see the liquor vents are so the lights around the liquor vent, the kind of you know uh, the attractiveness is increased so that people are kind of more drawn towards towards it. Um, we, uh, in terms of Bihar, of course, we they talk about body bag. We only mention in terms of policy that alcohol, unfortunately, is one of the biggest excise revenue earners in most states. So states are very dependent on alcohol for excise revenue, and uh, you know that's why you see that they're very, very. And, that, and I think that a fact that a lot of very, very powerful people are in the alcohol industry. Uh, these are, this used to happen with the tobacco industry and it still continues to do, and therefore there is a great hesitation to actually, you know, use some of the WHO measures or the you know, public uh, uh, reduction in alcohol use. So I think there are several other supply-related issues also 
there's also this issue of seconds and thirds in terms of the taxation uh, that occurs. So a lot of the alcohol that you know, doesn't get taxed also enters in some way the, you know, the, uh, the uh, they also are, are responsible for a lot of the seconds and the thirds that are consumed in the market. So there are lots of other drivers uh, apart from the, just the demand for alcohol. So thank you now, it's just all on you. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have two perspectives. I, I was thinking as I was looking at the policy, it's not easy to implement it. Yes. I'm sure a lot of people are gunning for you, I mean, not you know, but you know, critical of you and it's going, uh, all the tremendous pressure. I mean, I, I know personally about the tobacco industry. Uh, you know, we have well documented in the world globally. Uh, I mean, I also face pressure for personally for the anti-vaccine groups too because I'm, I, I do a lot of uh, vaccination immunization pro vaccination work. But I can't imagine what kind of pressure you have. And two things I think that are multi raised, which one is of course the industry and other interests, Western interests as we would call that. Second, the tax issue, right, the revenue issue. How are you dealing with it? How are you addressing it? Okay, uh, two three things I will you know, mention before I go to these issues. Uh, first thing, you know, in NFHS 4, in 2015 and 16, you, because you mentioned NFHS 5 in the initial remarks, so I missed during my first uh, discussion. NFHS 4 mentioned that 15 plus male population in Bihar, there were 29% people who were taking alcohol in 2015 and 16. And that survey was conducted before prohibition, obviously during 14, right. 15, 13, uh, that period. The NFHS file, which came in 19, 2019, the survey was conducted in 17, 18, 19 during those period. And it showed that 15 plus population, male population, drinking alcohol was 14 point something, roughly 15 percent. So there was half way reduction in the population, male population drinking alcohol in Bihar. So we do not have any exact number in how many people left alcohol, drinking alcohol, but there was significant reduction in the consumption of alcohol in rural Bihar or say in the uh, state of Bihar. Now, now coming to the first uh, revenue side. Uh, in 2006, Bihar's excise revenue was roughly around 300 crores per annum which went up to 4,000 crore by 2015, last uh, revenue year, 15-16. So we had collected excise revenue till 31st March 2016, and that was roughly 4,000 crore direct revenue and indirect uh, economy, say, NCBRE, forward record linkages, laborers, other, uh, you know, if there is a one liquor shop, there are several shops running because of that liquor shop around it, okay? selling some other products which are used with liquor. So uh, roughly it was estimated that the, that economy at that time was worth around 10,000 crore for Bihar's economy. It was decided that we are giving up this much revenue. Okay. And from then onwards, there is no revenue from the excise side. During 2015 and 16, we had the other sources of revenue that Bihar had, like the registration, property registration, which also I handled, that was something around 3,000 crore, which has increased to 6,000 crore now. Now, we had sa uh, sales tax, state sales tax, which is GST now. It was roughly around 11 to 12,000 crore at that time in 2015-16. Now it is 35,000 crore. So it has more than you know three times from whatever it was in 2016. So whatever shortfall we had in the revenue, we are able to make up for it. You can say that even the 3,000 crore, 4,000 crore of excise would have become 10,000 crore. That is also a possibility. But we are not considering that. The other criticism that is you know, put forward is tourism. That tourism will be adversely affected because of alcohol. Uh, we have international tourism places like Nalanda, Bodh Gaya, Rajgir, the Buddhist country uh, people come for pilgrimage now. So uh, it was criticized that they will not come here, they will go to only UP and from UP they will come and go soon, go back soon. However, if we leave this COVID period here, 
the tourism actually went up. The numbers of tourists has gone up. And that is incremental growth, what was previous to prohibition, and that continues after prohibition. When we consider it as overall economic activity as a whole, you know, Bihar has grown 9.6 to 10 percent in last seven, eight years as GDP you know, rate. So there is no not much impact, you know, say negative impact. The other uh, criticism, one of the one, one of the other criticism is that the um, hotel industry will suffer. Mm -hmm. The programs, the marriage ceremonies, and all they will shift from Bihar to other. It happened initially. There was big news in media also that workshops, conferences are being shifted from here to there. But in the last six years, there is not a single restaurant or a hotel that closed down in Patna or anywhere in uh, Bihar. There have been multiple units which have come up. They've opened their branches. Actually, it is growing. And this we, we, come, we get from the data of GST. Because GST collection is increasing. GST registration is also increasing. And you see, the <coughs> during COVID period, uh, the study that revealed that because there were was, there was a lot of you know, layoffs, there were a lot of uh, job closures, people returned to Bihar. Monthly, they used to spend 1,000 to 2,000 after alcohol. And that they were able to save. And that saving was very useful for them during these two years. This we came to know during our study. You know, we were not able to guess that this will be helpful in that way also. But the <coughs> migrant laborers that returned to Bihar, they were able to say, and they told that because of alcohol prohibition, because then there is less temptation to drink, because the, it is risky, right? If we are caught, we will be with police people, and that is more troublesome than having fun with alcohol. So it was like, for economy also, it was beneficial for us. And uh, um, I think I have told your questions, right? Yeah. I, I'll follow up on a couple of things. But as we are running out of time, I also want to give an opportunity for the audience to ask some questions. Uh, so if anybody has questions, uh, please feel free to ask any other panelists. And then uh, I'm not checking my messages. I'm also getting messages from WhatsApp on a question. So I'm going to keep following it. Uh, Dr. Ramya Pinamaneni, our research associate, back in Boston, got up very early, Ramya, thank you, uh, is sending me questions from the, from the web. So while, while I'm looking at those questions, Dr. Seigel, go ahead. Uh, so I guess my question to uh, Ms. Bandri, uh, excellent. This is. If you can, if you can you speak up. No, 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 no. Please speak up so that people in the uh, okay. on the Zoom. Right. So uh, um, I must start by saying that this is really an excellent discussion, and uh, going to Dr. Murthy's point of you know how the pyramid for uh, consumption to abuse uh, is actually a pyramid, but the treatment and outreach pyramid is an inverted pyramid, and uh, that's where you know the example from Bihar comes really useful to understand how we can reverse the um, you know outreach pyramid as well uh, what one is seeing this whole normalization of consumption of alcohol and tobacco as well in fact tobacco of course you know there has been much more intervention when it comes to tobacco and that's how we started the discussion uh, however with ott platforms now uh, you know uh, the outreach of ott platforms per se in the population having increased so much and no matter what um, channel you are on and what you are watching, the consumption of alcohol and tobacco on these channels, or the presentation of consumption of alcohol and tobacco on these channels, is so disproportionate, I would say, and disproportionately high. And you know that the vector over here is interfering and uh, you know providing incentive to show that people drink, and um, whether it is alcohol or cigarettes. Um, the, uh, what was uh, you know what is your uh, uh, coming from the government side of course you know you all have put prohibition in Bihar and we are seeing excellent results as well but uh, coming from the government side what is your take on this you know it, it took so much hard work to get pictorial warnings on cigarette packets and now we are seeing this explosion of uh, normalization and consumption what is your take on you know how can the government handle this uh, I mean, we do not regulate OTT platforms as such, but in our Prohibition Act, even this is punishable offense. Right. To publicize, to promote, to encourage drinking 
or say products which are intoxicating by nature. So it is a punishable offence. So, uh, so you know, within Bihar, if anybody is even you know creating some uh, drama or movie or video or say song mm. which promotes uh, alcohol, it is punishable offence. Mm. And yet, you know, the outreach of OTT obviously goes. Uh, you are right. But right. No, I'm just <laughs> sort of discussing with you as to it's. It, it seems like a huge challenge that is yeah. coming up on the public health uh, community. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, this question has also come up. Uh, I was giving a talk. Uh, I think uh, earlier. I'm, I'm jet lagged, so I don't know when it was. But earlier this week, uh, with a group of IAS officers. So OTD is event for you and I streaming services, right? Okay. So Sorry. Uh, that's the Indian version. So uh, I think I, I it's not. I'm not the panelist, so I should shut up. But I, I, it's much more complicated when you yes. don't have the control directly. Uh, this is a huge. It's a global issue. That's mm -hmm. why I keep bringing this back. Any time you want regulation, it's not about one single state, one single nation state. It's a global problem. You have to take a global approach to these things, not one thing. So I can go on for hours on that. <laughs> so, but I'm glad to know that there, there are some provisions. Yes. I have one uh, one question for uh, Dr. Godrej and Dr. Murthy, and and then I have one final question for each of you. So, so uh, for Dr. Godrej and Dr. Murthy, uh, there is a question uh, which says, given that we have a vertical health program approach. What would be your choice? Deal with alcohol use and addiction as a result of mental health issues or as a standalone dependence? Uh, do one of you want to jump in first? Or Dr. Murthy, maybe? And then Dr. Godrej. Yeah, so I mean, I think alcohol is all pervading. So I don't think we have the luxury of being able to only talk about it as a specialized kind of uh, you know, program, as a separate kind of vertical. Although the reason for at least starting both tobacco and alcohol as verticals was that there was nothing existing in the country. <coughs> and given that 20 to 25 percent of males use alcohol, uh, you know, and 5 percent of the population is in a dependent pattern, there is a need there. But there is equally a need to look at alcohol as a risk factor for communicable as well as non-communicable disorders and therefore take it out into the larger health spectrum. All of us have been discussing also the, the fact that there is a cohort effect, younger people are using it, so you've got to improve you know, awareness and the denormalization of alcohol in the community. So I think it just needs to be several different kinds of approaches to be able to minimize the harms from alcohol, to you know, look at community uh, approaches, population-based approaches to reduce accidents, to reduce uh, IPV, etc. At the same time, to also give people, I remember you know, 20 years ago when I did a program in a slum area in Bangalore, one of these guys in his 40s told me, I wish somebody had told me this when I was younger, I might never have reached this point. Right. That stays with me. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, thank you. Maybe uh, Dr. Sure. and then I have one final comment. I, I think we time. need to really take alcohol and integrate it into our complete healthcare system. A doctor or a healthcare provider should approach it just as they would a cough. You know, how long have you had it? When have you taken it? Have, you know, is it is it loose? Is it uh, you know, uh, is it hacky cough? I mean, you need to go into it, and I think that it should be so accepted for people to come with any kind of questions about alcohol, whether it's use or abuse or dependency, I'd like everyone to think of it as they would any other symptom or any other disease. I think it's a bit of a stigma, but we need to break that. We need to not have it be associated as a mental health issue because, of course, people who have mental health issues have a higher you know, incidence of using substances. And people who use substances will also have, you know, additional mental health issues they need to then cope with. So I think probably to leave that aside and just try and see uh, exactly, and it's different, you know, rural versus urban, a 16-year-old versus a middle-aged person with obstructive, you know, lung disease, um, and just really take person and find out why they started smoking, 
why they've not been able to stop, and what it's going to take to get them to stop. And I think if you approach it that way, uh, you are going to see uh, much more successful outcomes. Wonderful. Thank you. So we are almost out of, actually we are out of time. I have one final question for each of you. Completely unfair to all of you, but I am the moderator, so I can get away with asking <laughs> this question. Uh, so 30 seconds for each of you. If you have to do one priority, if you have one priority, whether it's a research data, whether it's policy, whether it's intervention, what would be that one priority for you? Zimin, since you are far away and you can't scold me easily, can I <laughs> go with you and then I'll go to the rest of the panelists. So you're talking about sort of like a strategic area. So yes. I focus on research. I would love to, um, I would like to advance the evidence about alcohol policies um, uh, research in India uh, because the way how regulation is being implemented and um, and the context is still different substantially between US and India even though the way that alcohol control regulation is done at the local level. Um, I think there is a huge vacuum of evidence uh, despite some of the evidence that we see in developed countries that alcohol policy, they work. Um, but um, I would love to see more um, research on alcohol policy research um, in India done, and uh, that's where I put my, my efforts and I will advocate the, the field to advance that area. Excellent. Thank you. That was 35 seconds, I mean. I just want you to know. <laughs> so thank you, but that was great. I agree with you on the policy. Dr. Murthy? I'll take a refuge in the Beatles and say help. I think a lot of people need help to deal with a variety of alcohol-related problems, including better literacy about the effects of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, that all state governments should realize that excise revenue actually should be offset with the kind of health-related, public health-related problem that alcohol causes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important in policy. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gaudry. I think that uh, going to her question that media has a huge role to play and I think whatever we can do to monitor and enforce policies which uh, you know don't have people uh, glamorize alcohol and smoking would have a huge impact on the young from ever starting any of those habits. Since it's, that is my area that will keep me employed for a long time. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, Mr. Hanji, you have uh, the last word. Yes, yes. Uh, I will take you know, this one step forward and uh, name it as you know, the awareness campaign. Yeah. You know, awareness campaign, including all stakeholders, all the departments, its rural development, panchayat department, urban development, health department, police, home department, all departments together, civil society, NGOs, practitioners, it all needs to come together and create this awareness campaign. You know? That's it. Thank you. That's a systems approach. Uh, I cannot uh, thank the panelists enough, Dr. Semi Swan, Dr. Fatima Murthy, Dr. Karthike Ranji, and Dr. Rati Godrej. Thank you so much. Give them a big hand. <laughs> and we can a few more hours.